Welcome. Did everybody have a good week this, this week? Depends on how you look at it. All right. Yeah, I know. There's a lot of people who've been sick and fighting that off. Good to see some of you back this evening. All right. Well, this is our last class before Christmas. Actually, our last class till next year. All right. And so uh, next class is January 2nd. We're going to start the new year off. All right. Uh, the first Tuesday there in January. So we have a couple weeks off. Uh, tonight you need lesson 12, and that is uh, pages 65 through 68. And if you want to, uh, again, as always, put your class notes and your lesson home study rate side by side as we'll be referring back and forth. Take a moment, if you haven't already, on page 67 to number your boxes on your class notes as we'll be going through them this evening. And we will be starting in Exodus 5 uh, this evening as well with the plagues. Now, another uh, announcement, we do have some new items back in the library. Our library has grown and is begging for you guys to check it out. And now over our two-week uh, break is a good time to check out some of those uh, DVDs or books. If you haven't already, sit down with your family or whoever you have and with you and, and go through some of those if you want. The new ones out there concern our study of Exodus. So I have the Exodus Revealed. Have any of you seen this DVD? Susie has seen this, yes. <laughs> All right, excellent, isn't it, Susie? Promo for this. This will really um, be a surprise to you. It's uh, what they found in archaeology, if you will, recently. And we will be talking about this in uh, two or three weeks here. This is the search for the Red Sea crossing. It also covers uh, Mount Sinai, Mount Horeb, where it is. And people that have gone in and have, found, have done the research and found out um, something surprising. Another one is the search for Mount Sinai. Now this is another group. There's two different uh, groups that go into the land and, and find it in Midian, as the Bible says. Um, and um, these two groups disagree. They each have a different view of where the Red Sea crossing would have been. But they both have such great information in it. And uh, in this group, the Exodus Revealed actually does some deep sea diving and finds some results of the Red Sea crossing. And so I highly recommend both of those. There's uh, some on the back table to check out. Oh, some are already being checked out, so good. Um, yeah. Susie, <laughs> Susie, you want to grab these maybe and put them? Yeah. Before they get to the back table. Okay. Which one did you want? This one. All right. And we can put this one on the back table then, unless somebody wants that. But check these out and watch them. You'll be fascinated. And on that one, Lori, there's also um, some other options. There's several options of things to watch. One of them covers possibly who the Pharaoh might have been, the one you got, Kay. And again, just a lot of different. So be sure to watch not just the main movie, but there's some other ones too. So. Highly recommend those uh, over the next few weeks. So there's a couple more back there if you'd like. All right, so I think that is all the announcements here as we get going. So let's go ahead and open in prayer. Susie, can you open us? Lord, thank you. Thank you so much that you gave us your word. Thank you that you brought each one of us here tonight and that also thank you that Brenda's teaching us. Lord, help us not take this opportunity lightly. Help us to learn your word and mm -hmm. help us to understand it. And Lord, for tonight, I ask that you help us to put away all the busyness of the day and to be able to focus on what you have for us. Thank you that in tonight's lesson you show us so many things and even give us um, your reasons for some of the things that you do. Sometimes we don't know why you do exactly what you do, but you give us reasons tonight. Thank you for that. Lord, I just thank you for this time and just ask you to bless Brenda as she teaches, to give her the very words you want her to speak. Help her to have boldness mm -hmm. and again, help each one of us understand. Mm -hmm. I thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you. All right. Well, last week we saw that God had sent uh, Moses 
And Aaron to meet with the elders of Israel and to tell them that God had compassion on them and that they, he'd heard their cry and he was going to bring them out of Egypt. And God had told Moses and, uh, that Pharaoh would not let them go, right, unless a mighty hand compelled him. And so here tonight's lesson, we will see the mighty hand of the Lord as we go through the passages tonight. So on, uh, on, in your class notes, box one there, that's on page 67, God's plan has always been to have a close relationship with his creator. Have you seen that thus far? Just his personal involvement all the way through. It's always been to have a close relationship. It still is. Time after time, he has shown that he alone is God and is worthy of our respect and obedience. Yet he allows each one to decide for themselves whether they will accept the truth that he is God and therefore follow and obey him or reject the truth and do as they please. If we accept the truth about God, we must then joyfully obey his commands. All right, in your home study, uh, page 65. In Exodus 5, we discover that Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and told him that the God of Israel wanted him to let the people go so they may worship him, right? Do you remember what the word worship meant in this context? To serve, to serve, to be a slave, to serve, to obey. Let's go ahead and start by reading Exodus 5, 1 through 3. Afterward, Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and said, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Let my people go, so that they may hold a festival to me in the wilderness. Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord that I should obey him and let Israel go? I do not know the Lord, and I will not let Israel go. Then they said, The God of the Hebrews has met with us. Now let us take a three-day journey into the wilderness to offer sacrifices to the Lord our God, or he may strike us with plagues or with the sword. Okay, so if you're highlighting in there, highlight what the Lord says in red, um, as they quote him in verse uh, 1 there. And then in verse 2, and we'll cover this in a minute, but Pharaoh's response, you can highlight in gray, right? What's Pharaoh's response? Who is the Lord that I should obey him? I do not know the Lord. Okay. So they asked for a three-day uh, journey. And I cover this in box two of your uh, class notes. Why did God tell them a three-day journey, right? When his intention is to bring them out of Egypt. So in your class notes, uh, box number two, it's probable that God had asked Moses... Uh, had Moses asked for just a three-day journey as a test for Pharaoh to see if he would honor the Lord's request. Pharaoh was given the opportunity to obey without it really costing him, right? God knew, however, that Pharaoh's heart was hard and he would not obey. This would show the Egyptians and the Israelites that God has given Pharaoh the opportunity and he chose to reject it. Doesn't this sound like what we've seen from God in the past? He asked a small thing of him for them to go for three days, and Pharaoh has that opportunity. So you might want to make note of that uh, from box number two in your margin, if you want to this week, so that you have the answer, because this is a question that people often ask. Why did God ask for a three-day journey when he really intended to take them out, right? Well, he's given Pharaoh an opportunity, okay? So you might want to write that into your margin so you have uh, the answers. And I think that's something that we can apply uh, in our own lives here. Box three on your class notes. Lesson for life. To add to your lessons for life sheet. Will you obey God in the small things? If not, you will be in danger of hardening your heart and not be prepared to obey him in the big things. Isn't that true? Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. So what was Pharaoh's response? This was your question in your home study. What was Pharaoh's response in Exodus 5-2? I had you underline that or highlight that in gray. Pharaoh said it well. Who is the Lord that I should obey him? This is box four. Kind of jumping back and forth here, but box four. Um, Pharaoh says it so well. He doesn't know the Lord, so he doesn't want to obey him. If we do know the Lord, we will want to obey him, right? That's the difference. Okay. So... He's basically saying, who, when we read it in English here, who is the Lord that I should obey him? He's saying, who is Jehovah? Right now, he knows about all these gods of Egypt, right? There's Happy, and there's all the different, there's Isis, and all these other gods. Who's Jehovah? 
right? That I should obey him. All right, and box five there. Again, we need to remember one of our key things. I gave you a bookmark on, on it, bookmark to remember to watch for these essential things as you study through God's word. And specifically here, your second bullet point, watch for what people do with God's revealed truth. God's going to show Pharaoh who he is. All right, we're going to spend the rest of tonight seeing that God will show him who he is and what does Pharaoh do with God's revealed truth. All right, that's what we're going to look for. So Pharaoh's not willing to let the Israelites go. They were his workforce, right? They were his slaves. He didn't know God, and therefore he did not fear him nor seek to please him. So the request so angered Pharaoh, what did he do? He increases their workload. All right, in Exodus uh, 5, 6 through 21, we see he increases their work. Box 6 there, another lesson for life. Not having the proper fear of the Lord can lead us to make very bad choices, right? Mm -hmm. That was a very bad choice for Pharaoh. Okay. And then uh, compare this to what God said would happen. This is in your home study. Compare this to what God would, said would happen in Exodus 3.19. Let's jump back. If somebody wants to read Exodus 3.19, we're going to reference back to this several times tonight. But I know that the king of Egypt will not let you go unless a mighty hand compels him. Okay. <coughs> so your class notes, box 7, next to Exodus 5. Two, um, where he says, who is the Lord that I should obey him? God had already said that he will not let him go unless a mighty hand compels him. And that has not happened yet, right? So, um, next in your uh, class notes, the word mighty hand, mighty or strong, used here means hard, bold, violent. It even has that connotation of being a violent hand. And hand means power. It means the means, like the resources, the ability. Okay? So God's mighty hand, his bold, hard, violent hand in this case for judgment, he has the resources and the ability to carry this out. All right. So again, as you're, if you're still in 319, if you haven't already, circle a uh, mighty hand. Unless a mighty hand compels him. And I highlight that in orange, as I said last week, because it's referring to God and what he's going to do here. And so circle that and highlight in orange if you want to every time you see that. And then what is Pharaoh's response as we see? Verse 4 through 9, if someone will read that. But the king of Egypt said, Moses and Aaron, why are you taking the people away from their labor? Get back to your work. And Pharaoh said, Look, the people of the land are now numerous, and you are stopping them from working. That same day, Pharaoh gave this order to the slave drivers and overseers in charge of the people. You are no longer to supply the people with straw for making bricks. Let them go and gather their own straw. But require them to make the same number of bricks as before. Don't reduce the quota. They are lazy. That is why they are crying out. Let us go and sacrifice to our God. Make the work harder for the people so that they keep working and pay no attention to lies. Okay, you see what Pharaoh is doing here? Not only does he not listen to Moses, he says he doesn't know Jeho Jehovah, why should he obey him? But he increases their work just out of spite. There is no reason for them to have to go get their own straw or change anything. He is doing this uh, to show his power. And Pharaoh calls them uh, lazy. He calls the slaves lazy and increased their already bitter work. So things went from horrible to worse, right? Even worse. Box 9 there on your class notes, lazy. Uh, the cities they built were proof that they were not idle or lazy. And in verse 9, he says, um, keep working, pay no attention to lies, right? He is saying what God said is lies, right? Moses has come and said, Jehovah has said, and he says, don't listen to these lies, right? So that's what Pharaoh thought of God's word. All right, um, so Moses has received opposition from Pharaoh, right? Just as God said he would. And now Moses received opposition from the Israelites. Now again, walk in Moses' sandals again. Remember how reluctant he was to come and do this, as God told him to do this. Now he's there. He's among them. 
and he's experiencing this. And so now we see he receives even opposition from the Israelites who had received the news well until now. Let's read 19 through 21. The Israelite foremen realized that they were in trouble when they were told, you are not to reduce the number of bricks required of you for each day. When they left Pharaoh, they found Moses and Aaron waiting to meet them. And they said, may the Lord look upon you and judge you. You have made us a stench to Pharaoh and his officials and have put a sword in their hand to kill us. All right, they're not happy about this. And you can understand that, right? Their workload just doubled here. And so uh, they are angry at Moses for this, for bringing this trouble. Box 10, though, on your class notes. Again, Moses is following the Lord, right? He's following what the Lord has told him. Box 10, Lesson for Life, following God is not always met with the approval or support, right? Do it anyway. Do it anyway. Moses is merely carrying out what the Lord has told him to do, and it's meeting with this opposition, and it's understandable here. But we see Moses cries out to God because of this. Let's read verses uh, 22 and 23. And Moses returned to the Lord and said, Why, Lord, why have you brought trouble on this, peop on this people? Is this why you sent me? Ever since I went to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has brought trouble on this people, and you have not rescued your people at all. Okay, can you hear Moses' frustration in here? Mm -hmm. All right, so again, he's obeying the Lord, and we saw in uh, last week, on, he starts off to come and do what God has called him to do, and then the Lord's angry with him and wants to kill him because he had not obeyed the Lord in circumcision. Then he does that, and now he's come, and he's, he's questioning God, why is this happening? You're not, you're not delivering them, right? Can you hear him? What we see here is, again, snapshots of Moses' growth, right? He's starting to grow in his relationship, in his walk with the Lord. And we get to see these pictures along the line, uh, along the way here. Um, as we saw with Abraham, they didn't get everything right, right away, right? They, uh, they grew in their faith and their understanding. And so here we see that he's going to the Lord, which is the right answer. Uh, but he's concerned that God is not doing what he said he would do. And so we'll see his, his growth in faith and obedience in relationship with the Lord uh, just over the period of one year. When we come and see where he is one year from this day, it's amazing to see his, his faith and his growth. So starting out here, he questions this. And um, he's asking, you know, why did you let this happen? We want better, not worse, right? We want to be rescued, not given twice the labor. But was this a surprise to God? No, because again, back in 319... Let's turn back there and read verse 20. We had said, until a mighty hand compels him. What does 3, uh, 20 tell us? But so I know I, that the king of Egypt will not let you go unless a mighty hand compels him. And verse 20. So I will stretch out my hand and strike the Egyptians with all the wonders that I will perform among them. Among them. After that, he will let you go. Okay, has he done that yet? No. No. All right, so we're still in the story here, and Moses is getting frustrated, but God has not yet done what he said he would do. So again, in your class notes there, next to uh, Exodus 5, 22 and 23, you can also reference back to Exodus 3. That's box 11. All right, until a mighty hand compels him, until God does his mighty works, they will not let him go. Things will get worse before they get better, right? Okay, so God had not rescued them yet. Moses is saying, you haven't rescued us. You haven't done this. And God has not done it yet. He has not yet used his mighty hand. He had a plan, and it would be carried out on his schedule. That's something we need to keep in mind as well, right? So Moses will grow in his faith as he sees God carry this all out. But right now, Moses is frustrated that the Israelites are upset here. In box 12, another lesson for life. Is anything a surprise to God? Can you roll with it regardless, as we saw Joseph did? Our reactions show us where we are at in our growth with him. Right? His reaction here, Moses' reaction here to God shows where he was in his growth. Right? And he will grow. Our reactions to things show where we're at as well, as we talked about when we studied the life of Joseph. All right. 
And what reason does God give as to why Pharaoh would release the Israelites in uh, chapter 6? Let's read verse 1. And then the Lord said to Moses, Now you see what I will do to Pharaoh. Because of my mighty hand, he will let you go. Because of my mighty hand, he will drive them out of his country. Okay, so circle that. He says it twice in verse 1. My mighty hand. Circle that and highlight that in orange. All right, so the Lord confirms to Moses that he is about to do all of the things that he said he would do. And then again, you can reference uh, 6.1 back to 3.19 as well. That's in uh, box 13, your references there, because of his mighty hand. All right, and then in this uh, verses here, um, highlight the names of God. In verse 6, it says the Lord, that's Jehovah, right? Jehovah said to Moses. And then in verse 2, we see Elohim said to Moses, I am Jehovah. I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty. Which name of God is that? El Shaddai. I appeared to Isaac and Jacob, Abraham as El Shaddai. That's all sufficient provider. And that's in your class notes there, box 14. Verse 3, I appeared, oh, I read that. Um, but by my name, Jehovah, I did not make myself fully known to them. All right? In the King James it says, I was not known to them. But by my name Jehovah, I was not known to them. So God's saying something very interesting here. Um, he says that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob knew him as El Shaddai. Right? All sufficient provider. But that they did not know him as Jehovah. But we've seen from the very beginning, right? From Genesis 2, that mankind knew him as Jehovah. Right? Right? So what is God saying here? He's saying something much deeper. God is saying that he did not show fully who he is, as it says there in verse 3. I did not make myself fully known to them as Jehovah. They did not experience fully who he is in the same way they experienced him as their provider. Have they experienced him as El Shaddai, as their provider? as he has provided through uh, for Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, they've experienced that. But now to Moses and the Israelites, he's going to show them more of who he is as Jehovah. Okay? So let's follow this for a minute. Box uh, 15, I explain it. Exodus 6.3, By my name Jehovah, that's the, the YHWH, I was not known to them. They did not fully comprehend it. They did not see from experience the fullness of who I am. Jehovah is the redeemer, the perfecter, the completer. He's the covenant keeper and fulfiller. Now they would see him as Jehovah, the completer and fulfiller of the covenant, fulfilling what he had told Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob he would do. Okay, so their forefathers believed though they had not seen the covenant come true, right? He had made their covenant, I will do this. To Abraham, what did he say? I will take your descendants into a country not their own, and in 400 years I will bring them back, right? They knew that. That's the covenant maker. But they did not experience the covenant fulfiller. Does that make sense? I have it on the board. So they knew him as Jehovah, the covenant maker. This generation is going to see him as Jehovah, the covenant fulfiller. All the things that he told Abraham and Isaac and Jacob are now going to come true. Does that make sense? They're going to experience that. So this is what God is telling them there. He's telling Moses, this, uh, this generation will see him complete these things that he has promised to them. Okay. So uh, you can add that to your characteristics of God chart if you want to. Um, this is your characteristics of God chart. And down at the bottom here, I have now God would show himself as Jehovah, the completer and fulfiller of the covenant, fulfilling what he had told Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob he would do. Okay? So you see, again, his plan throughout the ages, and you see him fulfill it. And we've talked about with the names of God, every time we see a new name for God, we see that it lines up with what is going on at that time. And here, the name Jehovah encompasses so many things, right? It's his personal relationship. Jehovah also uh, is the I am that he tells Moses that he is. Um, 
And here we see that he is the covenant fulfiller as well. Does that make sense? All right. So Exodus 6, uh, let's read 4 and 5. And you can highlight what the Lord is saying here in red. 4 and 5, please. I also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan. And they resided as foreigners. Moreover, I have heard the groaning of the Israelites, whom the Egyptians are enslaving. And I remembered my covenant. Okay, and it was, as we talked about last week, to say that he remembered something doesn't mean that he had forgotten and now just remembered, but that now he is going to fulfill at just the right time exactly what he had planned to do. All right, it is now off the back burner, if you will, and pulled forward. He is going to now do this. Okay, and what promises, this is in your home study, what promises did God make to Moses in Exodus 6, 6 through 8? So highlight what God says in red and then underline uh, what he promised, promises Moses. And if you want, you can number them. I'll go ahead and read this. In verse 6, Therefore say to the Israelites, I am the Lord. Again, highlight that in orange. And I will, number one, bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. I will, number two, free you from being slaves to them. And number three, I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and mighty acts of judgment. I will, number four, take you as my own people. Number five, I will be your God. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God, who brought you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. Verse eight, number six, I will bring you to the land I swore with uplifted hand to give to Abraham and Isaac and to Jacob. And number seven, I will give it to you as a possession. I am the Lord. All right, so I am giving you the land I swore with uplifted hand. That was the, the, referring to the covenant, right? Where he swore. Who did he swear by when he made the covenant? Himself. Himself, because there is no one higher. Yeah. Okay, so I am Jehovah. And so you can number those. I will bring you out. I will free you. I will redeem you. I will take you as my people. I will be your God. I will bring you to the land promised your forefathers and give it to you as possession. And as you notice, he starts that in verse 6 with, I am the Lord. And how does he end it in verse 8? I am the Lord. You know, this is established. This is what is going to happen. He starts and ends with the truth of who he is and what he says will happen just as he said it was, because he is Jehovah. He's the covenant maker, and he's the covenant fulfiller. All right? And so thus saith the Lord, this is what will happen. So again, Moses has come to him with concerns. Why is this happening? Things are getting worse. You've not done, and what does he say? I am the Lord. These are the eight things I'm going to do. I am the Lord, right? He can put his complete confidence that all of this will come to pass. All right, so Moses is growing here in his relationship as the Lord reveals this to him. In your home study 65, what was God's purpose in sending the plagues? And I have answered that for you in your uh, class notes on page 68. Okay, so in your class notes, box 16, I guess I've, I've outlined those if you didn't get those uh, underlined in your Bible. They're there, but on page 68, the first box... What was God's purpose in sending the plagues? Again, to free the Israelites, we see in verse 6, from their bondage in Egypt, and to show the Israelites that he had come to rescue them with a mighty hand, right? Um, and in 7, to serve as a reminder that God led his people out of bondage to bring them to, into the land God had promised their forefathers. And then what does verse, did we read? We read 5, right? Um, uh, oh, we're in uh, 7, 7, 5. Somebody want to read, jump ahead to 7, verse 5. And the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord when I stretch out my hand against Egypt and bring the Israelites out. Okay, one of his purposes in the plagues? So the Egyptians would know he's the Lord. All right? Now the Egyptians worship many things. They worship the Nile River. We're going to talk about that more in a minute. They worship the sun. They worship bulls and frogs and grasshoppers. Did you see my little uh, brass grasshopper back there? That's in honor of tonight's lesson. I was going to bring real ones and <laughs> fill them out, but uh, Michael didn't. He didn't like that idea. No. So, um, 
But can you imagine, they worship the grasshoppers. It's like, whoop, whoops, I think I just killed a god, right? <laughs> um, it's just, they'd lost sight of God, right? And they worship the things he had created. Does that sound familiar? From your memory verse, right? They worship basically Satan, who is the power behind these false gods. And that does take us to your memory verse. Uh, we had a longer memory verse this uh, week, but let's look that up. Uh, Romans 1, 18 through 23. That's page uh, 1758. Romans 1, 18 through 23. Unless anybody's got that memorized and is brave. Romans 1, 18 through 23. And as I was saying before class, this is a real important passage. It's a longer passage, but very important for us to learn in this day and age. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Since what may be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power, and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that people are without excuse. For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God, nor gave thanks to him. But their thinking became futile, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like a mortal human being and birds and animals and reptiles. Okay, and then verse 25 as well. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served created things rather than the Creator, who is forever praised. Amen. All right, and that's just as true today as it was when Paul wrote this, and certainly back in Egypt, where we're studying right now. They worship, they saw, see, his divine uh, power, his invisible qualities, they can all be seen by what he's created, right? So we can look at what God's created and praise him for it. No, instead man chooses to worship the creation rather than the one who created it, right? And this is exactly where we find uh, Egypt in our passage uh, tonight. So they exchanged the truth of God for a lie. Isn't that foolish? Mm -hmm. Claiming to be wise, they became fools because they suppressed the truth of God. Does that sound like today as well? I think it's always been that way, right? The typical path that man takes if they reject God. So the wrath of God comes, all right? In box two of your class notes on page 68, the Egyptians had lost the truth of God and worshiped the things he had created. Now God is going to step in and prove to both the Egyptians and the Israelites that he alone is God. And so could the Egyptians have known the truth? Who were the Egyptians there in your box? Let's look up Psalms 78, verse 51, and you can reference that in your margin next to 7-5. He struck down all the firstborn of Egypt the first fruits of manhood in the tents of Ham. Okay, who are the Egyptians? Descendants of Ham. Ham. Did Ham know God? He did. Yeah. He's on the ark. He saw what happened before God destroyed the world, right? He knew the penalty for sin, right? And saw God's judgment. And that came because of people turning away from God. And now God will show Ham's descendants who he is. Right? They have lost track of who the Lord is through the years. They once had the truth, but now they've turned from the true God and made false gods, things to look like birds and animals and man, and worshipped them. And again, again that's from um, following Satan and demons. And then let's jump ahead back in Exodus to find one more reason why God sent the plagues. Exodus 12, verse 12, if someone will read that. Satan night, I will pass through Egypt and strike down every firstborn of both people and animals, and I will bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. Okay, so in box one, number six there, what was God's purpose in sending the plagues? To bring judgment on all these false gods that each Egypt uh, worshipped, the Egyptians worshipped. All right, so... Judgment on the false gods. God was going to judge all the things the Egyptians put their hope in. 
He would expose the powerlessness of Egypt's gods. All right. So we see here in box three, God was showing grace in bringing the plagues. As horrific as all of that was, he's showing grace. Okay, so God is graciously showing both the Egyptians and the Israelites who he is so they may turn and follow him. Right? They, they've, what he'll show them, I'll finish reading here, he'll show them the futility of the things they've placed their hope in. Right? They have deceived themselves in following all these false gods. And if any of you have done a study on ancient Egyptian mythology and their study of their gods, it's, it's like, it's crazy twisted and convoluted and all the things they had to do. Their whole life revolved around these false gods. All right? It's a mess. They've deceived themselves. God is going to show them who he is and give them that opportunity to repent and turn to him. See his grace in this? So even in bringing judgment, he's showing his mercy. All right? So sometimes it takes a tragedy to cause people to come to the Lord, right? To remove the things that they focus on. All right, so another characteristic for God. He's showing grace even in the time of tragedy. His desire is for all to turn to him. And I've put that on my characteristics for God's sheet there. Okay, so in your home study, before God sent any of the plagues, he first offered Pharaoh an opportunity to believe in him. In Ex back to Exodus 7, verse, uh, let's see, I... Red 8, 7, I'm in the wrong spot. 7, let's read 8 to 13 if someone wants to read it. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron, When Pharaoh says to you, perform a miracle, then say to Aaron, take your staff and throw it down before Pharaoh, and it will become a snake. So Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and did just as the Lord commanded. Aaron threw his staff down in front of Pharaoh and his officials, and it became a snake. Pharaoh then summoned wise men and sorcerers and the Egyptian magicians also did the same things by their secret arts. Each one threw down his staff and it became a snake. But Aaron's staff swallowed up their staffs, yet Pharaoh's heart became hard and he would not listen to them, just as the Lord had said. Okay, so verse uh, 13 there, highlight that in gray. Pharaoh's heart became hard and he would not listen to them. Okay, again, essential things. What do, do, what do people do with God's revealed truth? All right, you can also highlight in gray down in verse 11, sorcerers, magicians, secret arts. My husband said it was the demons. Yeah, it, it absolutely, that is the source of all such things today as well. Yeah, so Pharaoh's magicians also did the same things with their secret arts, right, which is demons. They possessed knowledge of the occult, black magic, which all comes from Satan. But Pharaoh was given an opportunity to accept the truth about God. God's still given that same opportunity today, right? Um, what will they do with God's revealed truth? And that leads us to box four in your class notes, A Lesson for Life. When shown the truth, we can reject it, as Pharaoh did. We can explain it away. We can give credit elsewhere, or we can accept the truth of God, right? And if we accept the truth of God, then we need to submit to him, surrender and submit. Okay, so in your uh, home study, what do you suppose God was showing Pharaoh and the Egyptians by this miracle? So even though their magicians could do the same thing, and that's impressive, right? Their magicians could do those same things. That's kind of scary, isn't it? All right, by the power of Satan. Does Satan have power? Yes. Yeah, and that's why so many people run after that. Moses, but it's Moses' snake ate their power. Right? Exactly. What is God showing them? You can't beat me. Exactly. Exactly. Satan can give them power, but God's power wins. Yes, every time. Yeah. All right. So, again, now let's look at uh, 2 Thessalonians, see what 2 Thessalonians tells us about about this, Second uh, Thessalonians 2, 9 through 12, that's page 1850. It's very easy to be deceived because Satan does give power, right? But it's not worth it. Let's learn some more in Second Thessalonians 2, 9 through 12, if someone will read that. The coming of the lawless one will be in accordance with how Satan works. He will use all sorts of displays of power through signs and wonders that serve the lie. 
and all the ways that wickedness deceives those who are perishing. They perish because they refuse to love the truth and to be saved. For this reason, God sends them a powerful delusion so that they will believe the lie, and so that all will be condemned who have not believed the truth but have delighted in wickedness. Okay, that tells us right out that Satan does these counterfeit miracles, right? He has power and he will deceive those who have not turned to the Lord. That's a very scary thing, isn't it? And he'll send them a great delusion. People will follow Satan because they have refused the truth. That's in your class notes, box five. Counterfeit miracles of Satan. God sends them a delusion. They believe a lie because they refuse the truth. Now I tell you, there's a lot going on today, isn't there? And it is shocking that people believe the lie. And the answer is because the reason is, you know, my sons will say, how can they believe that? Well, I think we know the answer. It's because they've rejected the truth. Mm -hmm. And God has already said this is what will happen. It happened back in Egypt. It happens today. All right, now this passage in, in Thessalonians is particularly referring to the end times when Satan will do many signs and wonders. He will do great miracles right, that will just lead the masses astray. But we see that it's also happened all throughout history. All right, when people turn from the truth, who do they follow? There's two choices, right? When they turn from God, when they won't accept God, they are following Satan, right? There are only two choices, two masters. So let's get into the first plague uh, this evening. All right, and that is uh, Exodus 7, beginning with verse... Um, 14, we see the plague of blood there. Verse 14, uh, then the Lord said to Moses, so highlight in red what the Lord says, Pharaoh, Pharaoh's heart is unyielding. He refuses to let the people go. I've highlighted that part in gray. All right, just as God said he would. Go to Pharaoh in the morning as he goes out to the river. Confront him on the bank of the Nile and take in your hand the staff that was changed into a snake. Then say to him, The Lord, the God of the Hebrews, has sent me to say to you, Let my people go, so they may worship me in the wilderness. But until now you have not listened. This is what the Lord says, By this you will know, I am the Lord. With the staff in my hand I will strike the water of the Nile, and it will be changed into blood. The fish in the Nile will die, and the river will stink. The Egyptians will not be able to drink its water. The Lord said to Moses, Tell Aaron, take your staff and stretch out the hand over the waters of Egypt, over the streams and canals, over the ponds and all the reservoirs, and they will turn to blood. Blood will be everywhere in Egypt, even in the vessels of wood and stone. Moses and Aaron did just as the Lord had commanded. He raised his staff in the presence of Pharaoh and his officials and struck the water in the Nile, and the water was changed into blood. The fish in the Nile died. The river smelled so bad the Egyptians could not drink its water. Blood was everywhere in Egypt. But the Egyptian magicians did the same things by their secret arts. And Pharaoh's heart became hard. He would not listen to Moses and Aaron, just as the Lord had said. Instead, he turned and went into his palace, and he did not take even this to heart. And all the Egyptians dug along the Nile to get drinking water because they could not drink the water from the river. Okay, so there's a lot of gray in there, isn't it? Um, even the Egyptians, magicians did the same thing. I've highlighted that in gray. Again, they're using Satan's power. All right. And so Pharaoh had said, who is the Lord that I should obey him? And now God will answer Pharaoh's question. Right? He will show them that he is greater than all of their gods. Okay. So again, notice the contrast between Pharaoh, who does not know the Lord, and Moses and Aaron. So just to, uh, just to point that out again, let's go back to 7, verse 6. What does that, you should have some green there. What does that say about Moses and Aaron? They did just as the Lord commanded them. Right? Highlight that in green. I like highlighting in green in these passages because we don't get much of it. Right? The good things, things to learn and grow from. Moses and Aaron did just as God commanded in verse uh, 10. Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and did just as the Lord commanded. In verse uh, 20, Moses and Aaron did just as the Lord commanded. Are you seeing a pattern here? Those that know the Lord, right? They knew the Lord, and so they did just as he commanded. But Pharaoh does not know the Lord. 
so he hardens his heart against him. Okay. Now, the plagues uh, appear to cover approximately nine months. And those who have researched this come up with this because of the crops that are mentioned. God gives us enough information in here to realize that this is a process of about nine months. And um, uh, there were, uh, with the different plagues of locusts and frogs, um, these things were um, yearly occurrences, uh, but uh, uh, God sends them in plague form. Okay, so they did have frogs at some times and flies and grasshopper plagues, but this, uh, God's going to go over the top with all this. But it tells us, you know, that time has passed through this. So we see in your class notes box six, the first part there, that the Nile probably happened in July or August when the Nile rises. And so you have a chart on page uh, 66. Okay, Exodus 7, probably the first plague probably happened in July or August, and it's turning the Nile River into... Uh, blood. And what is the purpose there? Verse 17. So that you will know I am the Lord. That is his purpose, right? As Susie had said earlier that God tells us his reasons for doing this. He's attacking the Nile, attacking their false gods, so they will know who he is. All right, so underline that. That is his, one of his reasons. All right, so why God chose it. And we see that the, um, the Egyptians worshipped the Nile. Okay, so every year the Nile would flood its banks and it fertilized the land surrounding it. And so the Egyptians considered the Nile to be the giver of life. If the Nile doesn't flood its banks, nothing's going to grow. Okay, <coughs> so uh, they have found records in Egypt that record uh, songs, hymns that were written and sung uh, in praise uh, to the Nile because life for the Egyptians could not um, exist without the Nile. I have a picture here of the Nile, uh, that area. This is modern day. So if you can see, see how green it is here? And look 20 feet out. Pure desert. Solid desert. The banks of the Nile here have over flowed that level you have green the rest is desert okay so if the Nile doesn't overflow there is no life I watched a documentary video of a man who went there to Egypt and he filmed the fertile farm that was right next to the Nile and it was just lush it was just beautiful and then he stood just like this and turned around and he's standing on the line of the desert there's the beautiful lush farm and here's where the flood ended and it's desert. All right, do they depend on the Nile? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so no wonder they believed the Nile was their life giver, right? If they didn't follow the Lord, they know that without the Nile they can't live. So um, we, I actually found one of the hymns that they sing to the Nile. I'm going to go over this here with you. You can't see it very well. But... Um, Interesting, this was written, I'll read this to you. The hymn was written about 2100 B.C. by a man named Keddy, who was apparently of low birth. This would have been a hundred years, uh, within a hundred years of Egypt being settled after the Tower of Babel. Noah would still be alive. And it would be about a hundred years before Abraham. And it says the Egyptians considered the Nile, I don't know if you can see that, the Egyptians considered the Nile as a form of a god, or at least the servant of a god, early Egyptians gave the Nile human characteristics, such as the, des the desire to accept offerings, the establisher of justice, the Nile River, the establisher of justice, the ability to conquer and to give to the people. Additionally, it can be found that other written sources make reference to festivals during which the great quantities of produce were offered to the Nile flood. Now I found this, and this is just amazing. These these are what um, fourteen stanzas to a song in praise to the Nile, and it says, uh, "Let's see, um, let's see if I read how much of this. Let me just read some of it. Hail to thee, O Nile, who manifests thyself over this land and comes to give life to Egypt." Mysterious is thy issuing forth from the darkness. On this day thereon it is celebrated. Watering the orchards created by Ra. That's one of their false gods. 
to cause the cattle to live. Thou givest earth to drink, an inexhaustible one. Path that descendants from the sky, loving the bread of Zeb, that's another false god, the first fruits of Nepra, another false god. Thou causest the workshops of um, Ta to prosper. Uh, in verse 2, it says, Thou createst the corn, thou bringest forth the barley. If thou cease to do your work, all that exists is in anguish. See the praise that it's given to the created rather than the creator. Uh, talking of the Nile here in, in uh, the fourth stanza, he says uh, he's the creator of all good things. The Nile is the creator of all good things. Its offerings are made in thanks to him. Uh, later it says, no dwelling is there which can contain thee. Stable are thy decrees in Egypt. You see what they're crediting the Nile with here? Um, it is his force that gives existence to all things. Nothing remains hidden from him. He causes all his servants to exist and all writings and divine words. Are they giving maybe just a little too much credit here? <laughs> Establisher of justice, mankind desires thee. Uh, supplement the to answer their prayers they would pray to the Nile okay are you getting a little bit mad with God here okay so man exalt thee like the cycles of the gods they dread him who creates the heat uh, even him who has made his son the universal master the Nile made his son the universal master okay uh, come and prosper, come and prosper, O Nile, come and prosper. They sing praise to him. This was written in the time of uh, Abraham. Is that what we said? All right, a hundred years after Babel. Noah's still alive. No, a hundred years before Abraham. Is this shocking, disgusting? This is what they would do in their worship, and they would give um, sacrifices to the Nile, and they'd have a festival each year. Okay, are you seeing why God makes a plague against the Nile. Mm -hmm. They put their hope and they give it attributes of God. Okay, he will not share his glory. Okay, so box six there. Um, well, box six, uh, uh, we, at, towards the end of the first line, uh, one of the gods uh, related to the Nile was Happy, the main god, Happy, I will pronounce all of these wrong, just so you know in advance. Um, the giver of life, and eternal life, okay? Attributes of God. Isis, goddess of the Nile, another one, the guardian of the Nile, or um, Osiris, who had the Nile as his bloodstream. The Nile, their giver of life, and their hope of eternal life died. It died and was putrid and brought death, right? Wasn't God just in attacking the Nile? All right. So again, put these notes uh, from your class notes into your margin so that you understand and are able to share with others. Um, now, if you do more research on this, in even in some study body Bibles, they will tell different names for different gods than what we use here. And they're probably all right. There were so many hundreds of false gods. We're just pulling out a few of the names. There are many, many, many more that were associated with the Nile and these others as well. So God's not just turning the Nile to blood. He's attacking their false belief system. Right? Susie. This is like 350 years after the flood, if it's 100 years before Abraham. Mm -hmm. So within that 350 years, they totally exchanged the truth for a whole system of gods because this guy in his praise of the Nile, he named a bunch of gods. Yeah. You know, how long? important it is that we know the truth and mm -hmm. we pass that truth on to our kids and grandkids because mm -hmm. it doesn't take long. Yeah. It takes less than a generation yeah. for kids you know, to not know. I, I have a first cousin who knows nothing mm -hmm. and my grandmother was a devout Christian. Mm -hmm. He doesn't know Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's because his dad never took the church. Yeah, we really live in a time of ignorance, it, it don't takes, we? It takes less than a generation. Yeah, 
It's difficult to find out the influences of the times. Too. The influences of the times, but I find it interesting with all of these challenges because we do what what they're exposed to today, and always have been in one level or another. The pull is always away from the truth, isn't it? Yes. Satan is not idle, right? No. And he hates mankind. Yes. So he does everything he can. And the reason he hates us, there's nothing you can do to win his approval. He hates us because God made us. So it's nothing personal, okay? <laughs> he just hates us and wants to destroy us because he hates God. But isn't it interesting that God tells us what we're supposed to do? When are we supposed to teach our children? When we rise up, when we lie down, when we walk across along the path, and what do we usually do? We give that responsibility to the church yes. once a week if they happen to cover the truth that week, right? So we are at fault ourselves, right? Because our life's busy instead of focused on training up the next generation. So God gives us his answers even in that, right? And yet each person has a choice, right? All right. Well, we see that they did. They had all turned from God here. And uh, what a grief as you think of that when you think of people today as well that are deceived. All right, well, what did on your chart there, what did the Egyptians do? We saw in uh, Exodus 7.22, they did the same thing with their magic arts. Um, but they could not resolve the problem, right? They could duplicate it, but they could not resolve it. So making more water turn to blood did not deal with the problem. It only made it worse. So why did they do it? You know, oh, yay, more blood, right? Um, they did it to convince Pharaoh there's no reason to listen to Moses. Moses can do his tricks. We can do the same tricks, right? And so um, it's a power struggle for them, right? <laughs> not to get rid of it, but to show that they can do it as well. So again, during this time, if you can imagine this, the, the Egyptians would be calling on their gods to rescue them. Right? But no God could rescue. All right. So what was on your chart? What is Pharaoh's uh, response? We see that Pharaoh's heart became hard. He did not listen to Moses and Aaron. He did not take it to heart. Okay, so you fill in your chart there. All right. And what was the Egyptians' uh, response? Again, they dug along the river to get clean water to drink. Now, I don't know how this happened because it sounds like all the water, See, but they were able to, to yeah, they were able to dig through and filter some through. It also didn't make sense to me if the river was already blood, how the magicians did the same thing. Yeah, so there was apparently some untouched water right. that they turned and they could dig through. So God, I, I see God's mercy even in this because they can't go a week without drinking. Right. Well, they were worshiping you know? the Nile. And yeah. It was the Nile that they were worshiping, not yeah. the digging of water. Right. Outside of the yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So God allowed there still to be water, yes. but it wasn't the Nile. Right. Because he's attacking the Nile. He's not attacking their water, right. but the Nile, the false god. Yeah, yes. well said. Yeah, any other thoughts or questions on that? Possibly a spring. Yeah, a spring that came of something. Yeah. yeah, so God left them away to get water. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. We don't know more than what it just says right there. But um but was there any distinction? Your last thing on there? Distinction, the blood was everywhere in Egypt, right? Okay. Now in verse twenty five, um, we see, let's see here, verse twenty five, seven days passed after the Lord struck the Nile. So either the plague on the Nile River lasted for seven days, or we're just now being informed when the next place uh, plague took place. Okay, so we don't know exactly how long the Nile uh, was blood, I don't think, unless you see it in there and I missed it. Um, but we see the next plague uh, comes on the scene here. And as with the <coughs> previous plague, Pharaoh's warned in advance. Uh, in verse 2, let me finish verse 1 here. In seven days after the Lord struck the Nile, then the Lord said to Moses, Go to Pharaoh and say to him, This is what the Lord says, Let my people go so they may worship. If you refuse to let them go. See, there's an opportunity for Pharaoh to, to act on it, to obey. But if you let, refuse, then I will send a plague of frogs on your whole country. So he's been warned and he had a choice in the matter. Okay? Um... He chose to reject the word of the Lord, and he hardened his heart. 
So this is a one week later in your class notes box seven. One week later, probably still in July or August. And then on your chart that you filled out in your home study, probably July or August. Oops, let me get this straight here. Probably July or August. Uh, frogs. And what is his reason? God chose it. The Egyptian worshipped frogs. Okay. Um, well, the, and the purpose in verse 10, what is his purpose in 8.10? Let's look ahead to that. What does it tell us? So that they would know that there was no one like God. Yeah. All right. So they would know. God tells his purpose in sending these plagues. So they'll know. They'll know who he is. There is no one like him. Okay. So underline that each time you see it or mark it in some way. God chose it because they worshipped uh, frogs. And in Gusick's uh, commentary here, I like to use him a lot. The Egyptian goddess Hecht is always pictured with the head of a frog. For this reason, frogs were considered sacred and could not be killed. Egyptians worshipped the frog as a female goddess because frogs were common around the Nile because they reproduced rapidly. Okay. So um, MacArthur tells us that Hecht was the symbol of resurrection and fertility. And from her nostrils, it was believed, came the breath of life. Are we hearing some attributes of God in here? Right? Okay, do you see why God attacked with frogs? Okay, so now this goddess has been found in Egyptian tombs with the inscription, I am the resurrection. All right? Again, you see God's dealing with this, his anger over this. So he was worshipped, uh, also the frog god Hecht was worshipped as the protector of childbirth. Okay, isn't that interesting? How did they come, I don't, how, okay. So here's a chart I have of a few of the gods, and again there are so many, but we have, um, let's see if I can find it here. Hecht is the, uh, let's see, where is she? Okay, she is, she is a protector in childbirth, but we also see down here, there was another one, a protector of childbirth here at the bottom. Um, Thorisis, goddess of fertility and women in labor. Uh, they had lots of gods. They covered everything. Isn't it interesting? We have one true God who is everything. He is all in all, but they need thousands mm -hmm. to cover his attributes. But um, I thought that was really interesting, too, that these two in particular are um, for women in, in labor, in childbirth. Don't you, didn't you find that interesting? I, I thought, you know, what would that, what would that look like? Um, <laughs> you know, I, I don't know. What do you think? Come on, you can do it. Keep it up. You're almost there. I, I don't know how they came up with that, but that was my... <laughs> That was my picture of it anyway. I don't think I'd want a hippopotamus in there with me. I don't know. What do you think? All right. That's my attempt at humor. But um, I have all guys. I have guy humor. Sorry. Um, but notice another one here. Uh, one of these false gods. Let me see if I can find it here. And I don't know if you can see it. It's uh, Bess. Can you see that? Bess is protection at birth. And you notice how it's represented? as a group of demons. Wow. Mm. Wow. Mm. wow. All right. And Satan definitely is after us from birth, isn't he? Oh, and in, in the womb as well. All right. So it says a lot. OK, again, in your class notes, box seven. Um, Heck, the goddess with a frog's head, protector of childbirth, assurance of future life symbol of resurrection. The Lord was showing them that their future was not in the hands of their frog goddess. Their goddess of the resurrection died and was piled up in heaps and stank. Mm -hmm. All right, is he making a strong statement? Yes. Against these things they put their hope in. The frog god is conquered. Their future hope is conquered. And again, get this information into your margins so that you understand it. And what did the Egyptians do? on your uh, chart. 
Oh joy. They did the same thing, right? But they couldn't get rid of them, right? They did the same things. More frogs. All right. What is Pharaoh's response in 8 through 10? He summons Moses and Aaron and says, pray to Jehovah to take the frogs away. Well, what about his own magicians and why couldn't they take the frogs away, right? He has to turn to Jehovah to remove the plague. And he says, and I will let you go. Again, he lied, yeah. All right, so even here he's showing that he realizes only God can take them away. He's beginning to see who the Lord is, right? What was his question? Who is the Lord that I should obey him? He's starting to see who he is, okay? All right, and so it's evident the Lord is more powerful than him, and he is considered a God. Pharaoh is considered a God, and he's more powerful than the gods he worshiped, yet he doesn't want to submit. And so what does he say in verse uh, 8 through 10, please, of chapter 8? Pharaoh summoned Moses and Aaron and said, pray, the, pray to the Lord to take the frogs away from me and my people, and I will let your people go after sacrifices to the Lord. Moses said to Pharaoh, I leave to you the honor of setting the time for me to pray for you and your officials and your people that you and your houses may be rid of the frogs, except for those that remain in the Nile. Tomorrow, Pharaoh said, Moses replied, it will be as you say, so that you may know there is no one like the Lord our God. Okay, so we didn't uh, read all of that, but there was frogs everywhere, right? Mm -hmm. And when Moses says, when would you like them to leave? I don't know, what would your answer be? <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> already, right? Yesterday. No, Yesterday. Pharaoh said, what's that? Yesterday. Yesterday. <laughs> um, he says, tomorrow, all right? He's in control here, right? So, you know, he's not about to give up or submit to Jehovah. Perhaps he wanted time for his magicians to get rid of him, maybe buy some time, right? But whatever the reason, he proves that God is in control, right? All right, again, God's answering Pharaoh's question, who is the Lord that I should obey him? All right, very strongly here. And so the uh, Lord's greater than their frog goddess of fertility. So if he is stronger, follow him, right? But Pharaoh refuses. Let's read Exodus 8, 11 through 15. The frogs will leave you and your houses, your officials and your people. They will remain only in the Nile. After Moses and Aaron left Pharaoh, Moses cried out to the Lord about the frogs as he brought on as he had brought on Pharaoh. And the Lord did what Moses asked. The frogs died in the houses, in the courtyards, and in the fields. They were piled into heaps, and the land reeked of them. But when Pharaoh saw that there was relief, he hardened his heart and would not listen to Moses and Aaron, just as the Lord had said. Okay, so highlight his response there in gray. Again, can you feel what the Egyptians are going through? Can you visualize it? Can you smell it? <laughs> right? All right, so they've got the plague on the Nile that stank, and the fish in the river died. The river smelled so bad, and now a week later, the, ran the land reeks of dead frogs. Right? They're living this. And the Israelites, too. Yes, yeah. Right? yeah. And so they're learning the power of God here, but they're going through this, this terrible thing. So again... Um, any distinction, as you said, Leanne, no, they were, they covered the land. So the Israelites faced this as too. So God gives Pharaoh and the Egyptians another opportunity to turn to him, right? I think this would be a good time to turn to him before <laughs> there's any more plagues, but they do not. Let's read for, uh, Exodus eight sixteen through 19. Then the Lord said to Moses, tell Aaron, stretch out your staff and strike the dust of the ground. And throughout the land of Egypt, the dust would become gnats. They did this, and when Aaron stretched out his hand with the staff and struck the dust to the ground, gnats came on people and animals. All the dust throughout the land of Egypt became gnats. But when the magicians tried to produce gnats by their secret arts, they could not. 
since the gnats were on the people and animals everywhere. The magician said to Pharaoh, This is the finger of God. But Pharaoh's heart was hard, and he would not listen, just as the Lord had said. Okay. So on your chart there, plague number three is gnats. Uh, and the Hebrew word used indicates a fastening or a fixing to you. So a type of bug that grabs you and sticks. Okay. A tick. A tick, yeah, that type of thing, or a, a, a stinger at least. And so um, it comes from the Hebrew word kinem, which is from the word that means to plant. Okay. So you feel their pain a little bit more here. Uh, the King James translates it as lice. All right, and so um, for 17, all the dust of the land became lice or gnats or stinging, attaching of some form. And so it shows the severity of this plague. And what was the purpose? The magi um, magicians recognized the purpose, right? What do they say? You can highlight in green. This is the finger of God. They're starting to understand, right? This is someone much more powerful than anything they have seen. All right. And why did God choose it? Okay. Well, um, lice were made from dust. And again, there's anybody's guess. There's so many of these gods. But it could have been an attack against Geb, the god of the earth, or Set, the god of the desert. Um, it may have been directed against the Egyptian priesthood. Because it's a law in Egypt that if a priest has lice or fleas or gnats on him, he couldn't enter the temples of God. So this plague totally shut down all worship of the false gods, all right, because they could not serve. So in box eight there um, are listed some of those gebs set, and it stopped the priests from serving. It shut down their worship services. All right. And what did the Egyptians do? Uh, they could not duplicate it. They gave credit to God. And what is Pharaoh's response in verse 19? Yeah, highlight that in gray. And is there any distinction on your chart? It's throughout the land, right? Okay, so God gives them another opportunity to turn to the Lord. And then in uh, Exodus 8, uh, verse uh, 20, let's see, it tells us uh, the next plague, the fourth plague. Then the Lord said to Moses, you can highlight this in red, get up early in the morning, confront Pharaoh as he goes to the river, and say to him, this is what the Lord says, let my people go so they may worship me. If you do not let my people go, again, he's given them opportunity, I will send swarms of flies on you and your officials, on your people, into your houses, the houses of the Egyptians will be full of flies. Even the ground will be covered with them. Are you getting a visual of this? Yes. But on that day, I will deal differently with the land of Goshen where my people live. No swarms of flies will be there so that you will know I, the Lord, am in this land. Again, underline that. This is his purpose. So they would know. I will make a distinction between my people and your people. This sign will occur when? Tomorrow. Do you think the Lord's playing on Pharaoh's word there a little bit? <laughs> Tomorrow. I've boxed that in or under, underlined that. All right. Do you think Pharaoh's starting to regret what he said here? Okay. Well, the fourth plague then on your chart. Is flies, possibly biting flies. And the purpose is so that you will know that I, the Lord, am in this land. Okay? And why God chose it? Uh, flies, uh, they had their God, uh, Uchit, was uh, their God manifested as a fly. And uh, what did the Egyptians do? Going through your chart there, it's not mentioned. Probably the same as the others. But what was Pharaoh's uh, response? We see in verse 25, what did Pharaoh do? Let's read that. Then Pharaoh summoned Moses and Aaron and said, Go sacrifice to your God here in the land. Okay, so what is he doing? He's uh, bargaining. Okay, you can sacrifice to your God, but just do it here. Don't leave. Okay? 
So he's bargaining with God. So in verse 25, Pharaoh told Moses uh, to have the Israelites make their sacrifice in Egypt. And Moses, uh, what does he respond? Verse 26 through 27. If someone. But Moses said, that would not be right. The sacrifices we offer the Lord our God would be detestable to the Egyptians. And if we offer sacrifices that are detestable in their eyes, will they not stone us? 27? Yes. We must take a three-day journey into the wilderness to offer sacrifices to the Lord our God as he commands us. Okay, so Moses says um, they can't do it there because the, Egyptian, the Egyptians would be outraged at their sacrifices, okay, because they're going to sacrifice cattle, right? And the Egyptians worshipped the bull and the cow, okay? So they're gods Apis and Hathor. And archaeologists have discovered the Temple of Apis in Memphis. I looked it up in Egypt the remains of it, and it's known as the embalming house of the apis bull. They embalmed their bulls. All right? Okay, now there's an ancient record. I got this from David Zuzik as well. There's an ancient record of a battle the Egyptians lost because their enemies put a herd of cattle in front of their advancing troops. It worked because the Egyptian soldiers could not shoot at the opposing army for fear of accidentally killing the sacred cattle. All right? It was against the law to kill cattle. Okay? That was brilliant, I thought. Okay, so sacrificing cattle in Egypt would infuriate the Egyptians, and Moses knew it. And so what is Pharaoh's uh, response down in verse 32? First he starts bargaining, trying to bargain, and then what does he do in 32? Somebody wants to read that. Highlight that in gray. But this time, also Pharaoh hardened his heart, and he would not let the people go. Okay. All right. So he tries to bargain, he tries to make a deal with him, and then in the end he hardened his heart. Another quote from David Guzik here is many people... Turn to God in a time of calamity, and when things get better, almost immediately turn their hearts back in hardness to God. Isn't that true? Mm -hmm. Pharaoh isn't an unusual specimen of humanity. He's rather a he's a typical one, right? Yeah. How could Pharaoh do this? Well, he's kind of acting like everybody else who doesn't follow the Lord, right? Okay. Box ten on your class notes. Lesson for life. Each time we refuse to obey God, our hearts become harder just as it did with Pharaoh. It becomes easier and easier to not listen to God and to go our own way. Also, like Pharaoh, people today try to bargain with the Lord. It shows a hard heart. Mm -hmm. Just <clears throat> obey. Just yes, Lord. Right? All right, and was there any distinction with this plague, the fourth plague? This is the first time a distinction is noticed. There was none in Goshen. Right. Okay. Let's read Exodus 9, 1 through 7. Then the Lord said to Moses, Go to Pharaoh and say to him, This is what the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, says. Let my people go so that they may worship me. If you refuse to let them go and continue to hold them back, the hand of the Lord will bring a terrible plague on your livestock in the field on your horses, donkeys, and camels, and on your cattle, sheep, and goats. But the Lord will make a distinction between the livestock of the Israel and that of Egypt, so that no animal belonging to the Israel, Israelites will die. The Lord set a time and said, Tomorrow the Lord will do this in the land. In the next day the Lord did it. All the livestock of the Egyptians died, but not one animal belonging to the Israelites died. Pharaoh investigated and found that not even one of the animals of the Israelites had died. Yet his heart was unyielding and he would not let the people go. Okay, can you imagine the amount of death with this plague? I mean, we've seen the frogs and that was terrible. But frogs are, what, this big, right? Can you imagine the horses and the cows and the sheeps and donkeys, all the 
the animals mentioned here. Um, imagine the stench as well. Uh, imagine the loss of labor, right? The camels, the horses, the donkeys, beasts of burden and transportation. Um, uh, they went to when they went to war. Uh, Egypt was known for their horses, right? And they would ride horses. Um, their horses just died. Who are they going to fight now, right? What are they going to do? And so this plague is devastating. Can you imagine America losing all its automobiles, all its machinery, all its workforce? You know, it shut the nation down, right? And this is uh, this is what's happened here. And again, they worshipped these things, some of them as well. So the plague was on all the animals in the field, okay? Um, where does it say that in verse 3? A plague on your livestock in the field. So it's possible that many would have been in shelters and not affected by this plague. Um, we'll see another plague uh, attacks some that were still <coughs> left. So all the animals, but all the animals in the field. Must have been because the... Pharaoh's chariots with horses yes. pursued them mm -hmm. and were destroyed in the Red Sea. Yes, yes. So those that were in shelters. Yeah, and we're going to see another attack later, but also this is over a nine-month period. So if they do lose animals, they can still go up and there's still time to get them from other areas mm -hmm. and bring them in. But yeah, all their chariots later <laughs> will have them. So um, again, you might want to circle that in the field in verse 3. Yeah. All right, that explains that. So again, this is a disease on your cattle, the cattle on your chart there, horses, cows, donkeys, sheep, goats, camels. The purpose? To show the Egyptians the protection of his people, right? Um, in verse 9, 4, I will make a distinction. And so he's going to show a distinction in the protection of his people. Why God chose it? Egyptians worship bulls and cows and other livestock. In box 11, um, Apis. The bull god, symbol of fertility, Hathor, goddess with a cow head. And so God's clearly showing Pharaoh all of Egypt. He's greater than, these are like their main gods next to the Nile. Hathor and Apis are one of their main gods. And this is who they had put their trust in. And what is Pharaoh's response for your chart? He investigated it, right? He found out exactly what Jehovah said is true. None of the Israelites' animals were affected. And so what does he do? He submits to the Lord, right? No, he hardens his heart. He will not let him go. And the distinction is there's none in Israel. So again, God gives them another opportunity to turn to the Lord. Let's read chapter 9, <coughs> verses 8 through 12. Then the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Take handfuls of soot from a furnace and have Moses toss it into the air in the presence of Pharaoh. It will become fine dust over the whole land of Egypt, and festering boils will break out on people and animals throughout the land. So they took soot from a furnace and stood before Pharaoh. Moses tossed it into the air, and festering boils broke out on people and animals. The magicians could not stand before Moses because of the boils that were on them and on all the Egyptians. But the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he would not listen to Moses and Aaron, just as the Lord had said to Moses. Okay, so the sixth plague there is boils, sores on man and animals. The purpose is not mentioned, but it's the same as the others, right? Why God chose it, box 12 in your class notes, boils. An attack on Isis, goddess of healing, on Sekhmet, goddess with power over plagues and disease. Sunu, the pestilence god. Imhoptep, god of medicine. All right. So their protector gods and their healing gods failed to protect and heal them. Right? They put their hope in these gods to protect and to heal them, to keep them safe. What did the Egyptians do? The Egyptians, uh, what does it say? They couldn't even stand in the presence because of the boils, right? They can't even function here. They can't even come before Pharaoh. And Pharaoh's response in 12, he, in 12, the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart. 
okay? And so he would not listen to them, and the Lord hardened his heart, and you can underline that, but Pharaoh had already hardened his heart against the Lord many times, right? The Lord now hardened it because he has a few more things he wants to show, right? And so Pharaoh refused to submit to the Lord, and there's a point where the Lord says, that's enough. You know, my glory will be shown, and he's going to carry out these plagues because Pharaoh's heart was already hard. He kept rejecting it, and he will continue to reject, right? But the Lord steps in here and hardens his heart as well. And I think there's some lessons for life in that, isn't there? Yes. There's a point of, of no return, if you will. If we harden our heart, if we do not follow the Lord and turn to him. And so um, any distinction here for your chart, we see that this was on the Egyptians, all right, on all of e on all the Egyptians. Okay, boils and sores, so not on the Israelites. All right, so as he goes on, verse uh, 13 here, we see the plague of hail. This is the seventh plague. Uh, the Lord said to Moses, get up early in the morning. Oh, did you see it? Uh, where was it again? He said, tomorrow. Are you catching that as you go through it? Yes. Yeah, my, my, uh, that was back in uh, 5. Did he say it again? But he keeps playing on that. Okay, so in verse 13, the Lord said to Moses, Get up early in the morning, confront Pharaoh, and say to him, This is what the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, says, Let my people go, so they may worship me, or this time I will send the full force of my plagues against you and against your officials and your people. And what is the reason? So you may know that there is no one like me in all the earth. Again, underline that. What is God's desire? That they would repent and turn to him. Right? Right? For not, by now I could have stretched out my hand and struck you and your people with a plague that would have wiped you off the earth, but I have rised, raised you up for this purpose, that I might show you my power so that, by, so that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. You still set yourself against my people and will not let them go. Therefore, at this time, tomorrow, box that in. The Lord just plays with that Pharaoh's response. I will send the worst hailstorm that has ever fallen on Egypt from the day it was founded till now. Give an order now to bring your livestock and everything you have in the field to a place of shelter because the hail will fall on every person and animal that has not been brought in and is still out in the field and they will die. So he gives them opportunity, right? He even gives them warning. Save your animals. Bring them in, right? And so those, uh, what did the Egyptians do? Those officials of Pharaoh who feared the word of the Lord. They obeyed. They obeyed. They're taking him seriously, right? They're starting to know who Jehovah is, and they're trusting him. And so they, um, they bring them in. All right. And so, um, yeah. But in 21, those who ignored the word of the Lord left their slaves and livestock in the field. And you can highlight that in gray. That's the difference, those that are beginning to believe him and those who don't. So in box um, 13, hail, this probably happened in January when the barley ripens and the flax uh, blossoms. And on your chart there, what is the purpose of the hail? So they would know there is no one like God in all the earth. He could destroy them, but instead he showed his power. So they would know him. And your uh, box uh, 13 again, the false gods. Nut is a sky goddess. Ra, the sun god, who controlled clouds and moisture. Set, gods of storms of the desert. And we heard Ra mentioned in the hymn to the Nile, right? One of their main gods. All right. So who is the Lord that I should obey him? Well, he's greater than Nut and Ra and Set. Their gods cannot protect them. But will they listen to him? Will they turn to him? That's up to them. So the Egyptians' response, we said, is uh, those that believed hurried and brought their slaves to safety. And what is Pharaoh's uh, response? Let's read 27 and 28. Then Pharaoh summoned Moses and Aaron. This time I have sinned, he has said to them. The Lord is in the right, and I and my people are in the wrong. Pray to the Lord, for we have had enough thunder and hail. I will let you go, 
and you don't have to stay any longer. Okay. So, I've sinned. I'm wrong. Pharaoh has a false repentance. Right? So, uh, Dr. Uh, Guzik in his commentary says, he said the words of repentance, but he did not follow through with the actions. Okay. So the livestock affected here, again, may have been surviving animals from the plagues, uh, um, perhaps that were not out in the field, or else Pharaoh had brought in more. Um, but there's a bit of time that has passed between these plagues on the livestock, and so there's enough time to get animals from other places as well. Okay, so let's uh, read verses 34 and 35. When Pharaoh saw that the rain and the hail and thunder had stopped, he sinned again. He and his officials hardened their hearts. So Pharaoh's heart was hard, and he would not let the Israelites go, just as the Lord had said through Moses. Okay, so highlight in gray. He and his officials hardened their hearts. Okay, they're already hard hearts, right? And... In the distinction for your chart there, God had given warning and instruction. And the distinction, there is none in uh, Goshen. So can you imagine that? That wall of hail, none in Goshen, and huge hail enough to kill the animals and anything that was left out, and none in Goshen. All right, so interesting point here. Let's go back up to verse uh, 29, Exodus 9, 29. Moses replied to Pharaoh, When I have gone out of the city... So, so Pharaoh has said, you know, pray the Lord. We've had enough hun thunder and hair hail. I'll let you go. You don't have to stay. And Moses says, when I've gone out of the city, I will spread out my hands in prayer to the Lord. The thunder will stop and there will be no more hail. So you may know that the earth is the Lord's. But I know that you and your officials still do not fear the Lord God. Uh, the flax and barley were destroyed since the barley and headed and the flax was in bloom. That's one of the verses that tells us what time of year this happened. Okay, uh, The wheat and the spelt, however, were not destroyed because they ripen later. And Moses left Pharaoh and went out of the city. He spread out his hands towards the Lord. The thunder and hail stopped and the rain no longer poured down on the land. Okay, did you catch what's happening here? Did you, did, he's standing in front of Pharaoh. Pharaoh says, okay, I've sinned. I'll let you go, pray to the Lord. And Moses left the place and walked out into the hailstorm that's killing everything. And he walks all the way outside the city, so outside the palace or wherever Pharaoh is, outside the city, spreads out his hands towards the Lord and prays, and it stops. Can you see the hail kind of parting around him, you know, with his un invisible umbrella as he walks? Is Moses growing in his faith mm -hmm. in relationship with the Lord? I mean, I'm thinking he could have prayed right there in front of Pharaoh, right? No. He waves, walks out into the hail that's killing everything in its path. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> All right. Moses remembers that he says that the Lord says, you will bring them back to this mountain, right? God's protection is on him. The God who's, uh, you will know the earth is the Lord's. Mm -hmm. God brings the hail. God protects who he wills. Who he wills, uh, wants to protect here. And so with the faith that this uh, took for Moses, all right, he knows he's totally protected by God. <coughs> I call it selective hail. <laughs> okay. God made a distinction right there, didn't he? With Moses. Yeah. Okay, so again, we see a little snapshot of his faith, Moses' faith, by this uh, seventh plague. So remember, times passed through these plagues, um, and new crops have grown, and the Egyptians got more animals. And uh, so again, the time has passed through all of this. Let's read chapter 10, verses 1 and 2. When the Lord said to Moses, Go to Pharaoh, for I have hardened his heart and the hearts of his officials so that I may perform these signs of mine among them, that you may tell your children and grandchildren how I dealt her partially with the Egyptians and how I performed my signs among them, and that you may know that I am the Lord. Okay, so again, we see here that the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart. 
He's shown Pharaoh and the Egyptians that he's the Lord. There's none like him. And um, so God hardens Pharaoh's already stone hard heart. And this is something to, to, to realize because, again, I have had people say to me, well, if God hardened his heart, then is Pharaoh to blame? Oh, Pharaoh hardened his heart many, many times, right? So <clears throat> God is just continuing the path that Pharaoh has already chosen. All right, as God re uh, progressively revealed more of himself and his power through these miracles, Pharaoh hardened his heart against the Lord. All right, and so God uses his mighty hand against Pharaoh. So the Lord's focus now is to show Israel that he is the one true God. So they will do what? They will tell their children and their grandchildren who the Lord is. So they will know the Lord. All right, so here we start to see the instructions given on what they are to tell their children. All right, and let's read uh, Exodus 10, 3 through 7. So Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and said to him, This is what the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, says. How long will you refuse to humble yourself before me? Let my people go so that they may worship me. If you refuse to let them go, I will bring locusts into your country tomorrow. They will cover the face of the ground so that it cannot be seen. They will devour what little you have left after the hail, including every tree that is growing in your fields. They will, feel, they will fill your houses and those of all your officials and all of the Egyptians, something neither your parents nor your ancestors have ever seen from the day they settled in this land till now. Then Moses turned and left Pharaoh. Pharaoh's officials said to him, How long will this man be a snare to us? Let the people go so that they may worship the Lord their God. Do you not yet realize that Egypt is ruined? Okay, so this is the eighth plague, is um, the destruction of crops by locusts. Okay, in your class notes box 14, uh, this probably happened in March or April when the east winds would uh, bring them in from the Arabian Peninsula. And plagues of grasshoppers were not uncommon in Egypt, but this is like nothing they've ever seen, all right? Uh, the hail had destroyed the barley and the flax in January or February. Now the locust would devour the wheat and uh, any other crops, fruits from the trees. So this is a devastating blow. And what is uh, the purpose? Again, back in 10-2, so that the Israelites will tell their children and their grandchildren. It's not their children and their grandchildren that saw God lead with a mighty hand. They need to tell them. And we're going to see this repeated over and over. Um, so the purpose, so you will teach your children who the Lord is. And why God chose it? Well, the Egyptians worshipped grasshoppers. Right? They worshipped locusts. Box 14. Um, Set, protector of crops. Senehim, God with a locust head, is a protector from pests. Nut, the sky goddess, uh, Osiris, the god of vegetation, would come back to life every year with the return of the crops. And so all of these are attacked. And what is the Egyptians' response in verse 7? They warn Pharaoh, right? How long are you going to let this happen? Egypt's in ruins. They've had enough. So even his officials are warning him. To let the people go, as Jehovah has required. I think Josephus, we've talked about Josephus before, historian, uh, somewhere around the time of Christ. I think he says it well here. He says, one would think the forementioned calamities might have been sufficient for one that was only foolish, without wickedness, to make him wise, and to make him sensible what was to his advantage. But Pharaoh led not so much by his folly as by his wickedness, even when he saw the cause of his miseries, he still contested with God and willfully deserted the cause of virtue. Okay, so someone who's just foolish but not wicked, they would have learned their lesson by now, right? But Pharaoh wasn't foolish, he was wicked. And so he did what was even more harmful to himself because he refused to turn the Lord. Isn't that well said in Old English there? So... 
What is uh, Pharaoh's response? Uh, let's read um, 13 to 20, Exodus 10, 13 to 20. So Moses stretched out his staff over Egypt, and the Lord made an east wind blow across the land all that day and all that night. By morning, the wind had brought the locust. They invaded all Egypt and settled down in every area of the country in great numbers. Never before had there been such a plague of locust, nor will there be ever again. They covered all the ground until it was black. They devoured all that was left after the hail, everything growing in the fields and fruit on the trees. Nothing green remained on tree or plant in all the land of Egypt. Pharaoh quickly summoned Moses and Aaron and said, I have sinned against the Lord your God and against you. Now forgive me my sin once more and pray to the Lord your God to take this deadly plague away from me. Moses then left Pharaoh and prayed to the Lord, and the Lord changed the wind to a very strong west wind which caught up the locust and carried them into the Red Sea. Not a locust was left anywhere in Egypt, but the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he would not let the Israelites go. Okay, again, Pharaoh has a false repentance here, and he will not let them go. And again, the wind changing direction like that was, it never happened like that. They had come in from the peninsula, uh, the Sinai Peninsula there, and God turns them back uh, into the Red Sea. So again, just amazing uh, control there. And again, any distinction? They were in Egypt only because it says everything left by the hail, and hail had not been in Egypt, in Goshen, right? Okay. And so he would not let the Israelites go. And so next we have uh, the ninth plague. Um, let's read 21 through 29. Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand toward the sky, so that darkness spreads over Egypt, the darkness that can be felt. So Moses stretched out his hand toward the sky, and total darkness covered all Egypt for three days. No one could see anyone else or move about for three days. And yet all the Israelites had light in the places where they lived. Then Pharaoh summoned Moses and said, Go, worship the Lord. Even your women and children may go with you. Only leave your flocks and your herds behind. But Moses said, You must allow us to have sacrifices and burnt offerings to present to the Lord our God. Our livestock, too, must go with us. Not a hook is to be left behind. We have to use some of them in worshiping the Lord our God. And until we get there, we will not know what we are to use to worship the Lord. But the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he was not willing to let them go. Pharaoh said to Moses, Get out of my sight. Make sure you don't appear before me again. The day you see my face, you will die. Just as you say, Moses replied, I will never appear before you again. Okay, so this is the ninth plague on your uh, chart there. Darkness. It was a darkness that could be felt. Can you imagine that? Uh, can you imagine the fear? Can you hear the children crying? Three days of darkness. Three long days and nights and no one can see anywhere. They have no idea what time it is, right? There's no, there's no sun. And yet, um, scientifically, if you looked to the east towards Goshen, you should be able to see light, right? Mm -hmm. But they couldn't. It was a wall of darkness. All right. So this gave them lots of time to think about who they put their trust in, right? Where was Ra, the sun god, right? So purpose is not mentioned on your chart there. It's not mentioned, but it's the same as the others. Why God chose it, your uh, box 15 on your class notes. Um, this probably happened in March or April. It's an attack on Ra, the sun god, who they say is the creator and the lord of heaven. Ra is given attributes of God here. Um, Horus, a sun god. Nut, a sky goddess. Hathor, a sky goddess. So many gods uh, in this. God attacks here. And what did they do? What did the Egyptians do? 
nothing. They couldn't go anywhere. They couldn't do anything. They couldn't see anything. And what is Pharaoh's response in 27, 28? The Lord hardened his heart. He would not let them go, right? And he became angry, and he sent Moses away under threat of death, right? And again, was there any distinction? Just filling out your chart here. The Israelites had light. Or they were. All right. Again, God's distinction. Isn't that amazing? What God has done. This is all actual history. All right. And we're going to cover the last plague in our next lesson in much more detail, but we're going to touch on it tonight. So in Exodus 11, verse 1, um, notice that in the NIV here, it says, Now the Lord had said to Moses. There's a past tense word here. Okay? So he has been with Pharaoh. And But the Lord had already said to Moses, I will bring one more plague on Pharaoh and on Egypt. After that, he will let you go from here. And when he does, he will drive you out completely. Tell the people that men and women alike are to ask their neighbors for articles of silver and gold. I, the Lord, made the Egyptians favorably disposed towards the people. Um, and Moses himself was highly regarded in Egypt by Pharaoh's officials and by the people. So the Lord had said, and um, this is kind of a, a parenthesis in the text, if you will. This is a continuation of Exodus 10. So Moses is still in the presence of Pharaoh. Pharaoh tells him, or um, he tells Pharaoh, Moses tells Pharaoh about this last plague before he leaves. Okay, so Pharaoh says, don't ever come back here again. And then we see... Moses does. All right, no, he hasn't left yet. Okay, so he's still in the presence of uh, Pharaoh. This is the same conversation from Exodus 10. And before he leaves, he tells Pharaoh about the next plague. Okay, and so the next plague here is death of the firstborn sons. Verse 4, Moses said, this is what the Lord says. So if you want to, from verse 29 of chapter 10... Draw an arrow down to verse 4. So Pharaoh says, Don't appear before me again. The day you see my face, you will die. Moses says, Just as you say, I will never appear before you again. But before I leave, this is what the Lord says about midnight. Does that make sense? Because people say, Wait, I thought he didn't. He didn't and how did he? Okay, well, he's still there. He's continuing the conversation. He says, About midnight, I will go throughout Egypt. Every firstborn son in Egypt will die. From the firstborn son of Pharaoh who sits on the throne to the firstborn son of the female slave who is at her hand mill and all the firstborn of the cattle as well, there will be loud wailing throughout Egypt, worse than there have ever been or ever will be again. But among the Israelites, not a dog will bark at any person or animal. Then you will know that the Lord makes a distinction between Egypt and Israel. All these officials of yours will come to me, bowing down before me and saying, Go, you and all the people who follow you, and after that I will leave. Then Moses, hot with anger, left Pharaoh. Okay. And the Lord said to Moses, Pharaoh will refuse to listen to you, so that my wonders may be multiplied in Egypt. Moses and Aaron performed all these wonders before Pharaoh, but the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he would not let the Israelites go out of his country. Okay, so death of the firstborn sons. And what is the purpose? We see in verse 7. The purpose, then you will know that the Lord makes a distinction. So mark that. That is God's purpose there. And then in verse 9, so that his wonders would be multiplied in Egypt. All right. And so the world would never forget what happened to them. And did you see that? We've seen it a couple times. This was worse than had ever been before or ever would be again, right? We saw that with a couple of the plagues there. That's prophetic. God looks in the future and says, this is the worst it's ever going to be, all right? And so in box 16, uh, death of the firstborn, and this occurred in April, and we know that because the death of the firstborn, uh, and then they'll have their first Passover, which happens in, uh, in April. Um, and so this was an attack on the protector of children. And um, 
Arasus is the resurrection, the god of resurrection. Pharaoh and his firstborn son also were considered gods. They were considered descendants of the sun, right, of Ra. Okay, so God is again um, dealing with these false gods even in this last plague, the death of the firstborn. And another uh, quote from David Busick here, an inscription. Uh, by Pharaoh on an ancient Egyptian temple gives the idea, I am that which was and is and shall be, and no man has lifted my veil. The Pharaoh was more than a man. He considered himself a god, and the Egyptians agreed. Now, who does that sound like? I am he that was and am and shall be. Does that sound like I am? All right. Again, claiming the characteristics of God. And God is going to deal with that here. So what was the Egyptians' response? In 11.3, we're told what they will do. They will give them things. And they saw that Pharaoh's officials highly regarded Moses. Uh, Pharaoh's response on your chart in verse 10, he would not let him go. And then in 12.31, what does he say? Somebody Jump ahead to 1231. During the night, Pharaoh summoned Moses and Aaron and said, Up, leave my people, you and the Israelites. Go worship the Lord as you have requested. Okay, so then he lets, he, uh, lets them go. On your chart, any distinction? Again, there was no death in Israel, right, in Goshen, but there was no death because of what God told them to do. And we're going to cover that next week. Or no, we won't cover that next week. We'll cover that next year. Okay? Um, but he doesn't just, a lot of the plagues were, Goshen didn't uh, suffer from the plague. But this plague, they will suffer unless they follow the instructions. And he gives them clear instructions on what they need to do. Okay? So Egypt had had a lot of time to see God's hand in all this. Right? They've had plenty of time to repent and turn to him. In your class notes, box 17, why did God choose the plagues that he did? He chose the things the Egyptians had put their hope in, right? The things they worshipped and held dear. And he showed them that he alone is God over the earth. He could have completely destroyed them. However, God in his infinite love gave them opportunity to believe in him. And apparently, we see that some of the Egyptians did. These things they put their hope in would fail them. They were deceived, and God proved that to them. And I would add to that that he also, why did he choose the plagues he did? Because they gave his attributes to things he created, right? And so he showed them that's not true. So, again, isn't that so personal of God to show them clearly where they had gone wrong, right? Clearly what... Uh, that they had been deceived. He gave them an amazing and powerful opportunity to turn to him. But, you know, as we think about that today, what do people today put their hope in? What are some things that people today put their hope and their trust? Money? Things? Yeah. Other things? I hear some mumbling. Government. Wow. Is that a good thing to put our hope in right now? No. No, it never has been. But you think about this. Um, only God provides for us, right, and intervenes for us. He is alone what we need to put our hope in. Think about it. If God was going to send plagues today, what would he attack today? The Internet. <laughs> yeah, the things we have placed in front of him, right, the things we've put our hope in and even maybe given his characteristics to. So what would our plagues today look like? Technology. What's that? Technology. Technology, yeah. Loss of internet and satellites. Yeah. And can we live without those? I don't think we can. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sarah? Half of the U.S. and yeah. here included the power. Yeah. I remember I was going to work with citizens when that happened. Yeah. Yeah, and, and how many of us could hardly function, right, for that much time? Yeah, but, but think about that. The stock market, the uh, banks closing, right? 
where we've invested our money. What if all that fell today? Who is our hope in? Is that the end of the world for us? You know, um, God is, you know, government failing, right? Uh, again, God has shown us through his word. He showed the Egyptians. He showed the Israelites. He's showing us who he is, right? Who is our hope in, regardless of what happens around us? That's one of the things we need to understand from his word. That's a takeaway for us, right? Okay. So, um, God's desire is for everyone to know him. But he gives them opportunity to turn to him. But the punishment must come for those who reject him. So that is the end of this lesson. Now, when we come back, um, the, the next lesson, I've given you your homework there. It's a short lesson. There's only uh, a few verses, actually, 30 verses or so, just, just chapter 12. And then we're going to spend the time. So there's not a lot of homework uh, this uh, over three-week period here. And so I challenge you to go back and catch up on anything you're behind or get your cross-references in, your highlight, because I know none of you are busy over Christmas, right? <laughs> um, but also to check out things from the library if you want to spend some time uh, on your downtime watching some of those, you will not uh, regret it. And um, so that, uh, I think that's the end of our lesson tonight, but um, all of you hope you have a Merry Christmas and enjoy your time. And we will uh, close in prayer now and let you go. All right, let's pray. Lord, again, we just thank you so much for your word. We just thank you for giving this to us and preserving it for us. And, and Father, forgive us for not taking to heart and, and making this our top priority to know you through your word because, wow, what, what amazing things you show us as to who you are. And even to hear your heart that your desire is that we may know all throughout the generations, who you are, and that you, you call us to teach our children and our grandchildren and to never let it slip from our minds and from our, our teaching and showing them. Father, you call us to live wholeheartedly for you. If we know who you are, then we will follow you. We will obey you. We just thank you for these examples as we learn from, from history who you are through your word and how you have dealt with mankind throughout the ages. Thank you for that. Just really challenge us and these different areas to apply to our own life. And I thank you for that. Just go with us uh, over this time and just continue to teach us through your word. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. amen.